Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long. As always, it's my pleasure to have back with me today Charles Hugh Smith, well-followed and prolific writer on the web who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Welcome back, Charles. I hope you continue to be safe in Hawaii. Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon. And it's uh, it's great to be on um, on the topic of today. And uh, it's been a it's, it's been almost a decade that we've been doing these programs, and I it's interesting that. We're following the same threads um, that that we picked up in 2011, and uh, they've matured. Charles, before we be begin, as I normally do, I need to stress with our new viewers that this is not an interview. We do these videos as a way of us productively dialoguing the important trends we are identifying and simply make these discussions available to the public for those that might uh, be interested or want to contribute uh, in some way, and so we welcome anybody and everybody's uh, uh, comments. They're, they're particularly valuable in the way of feedback for uh, for us and ideas you have on the subjects we're talking. Charles, today we're we're going to talk about the frustrations with the sense of unfairness uh, we both sense is um, reaching a boiling point in, in America. Uh, as such, we hope to cover the subjects I've, I've have listed here. Um, but before we do, any comments on, on this agenda, Charles, you want to say as, before we begin? No, I think we we'll just uh, proceed with your slide pack, and I think we're going to cover a lot of ground, so stay tuned. Yeah, we'll move through quickly because we all, as usual, um, we have a lot of slides. But if just as a way of background, we both independently, uh, for our viewers' uh, awareness, put together a, a list at, at a very high level of at least our individual perceptions of the frustrations uh, in that we've been talking about, writing about here in the U.S. So we'll start there, and then we'll see if we can synthesize any meanings, uh, meanings that are coming out of um, the points that we're making. So uh, we'll start, Charles, with uh, your list, and, um, and then I'll go through um, my list here. And I have up your list right now. You know, the topic is rising frustrations, and the first thing that comes to my mind is this is a very long-term, fundamental, structural source of frustration. In other words, the economy, and to some degree, the society that's based on the economy, is just simply no longer functioning as it did a generation or two ago. And so these uh, these frustrations that we're seeing in uh, demonstrations and uh, uh, political frustrations, they actually all go back, in my mind, to the economy. And um, the RAND Corporation uh, recently came out with a study that surprised a lot of people. And, it, and they were looking at income trends in the United States from 1975 to 2018. And they found that um, basically $50 trillion had been transferred from labor to capital. In other words, going back to the, the heyday of American labor in terms of the purchasing power of your wage and your social mobility and everything was literally 45 years ago. And it's been a slow degradation since then for the majority of, 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 of workers. And so, and I think the other thing that Gordon and I have talked a lot about, and other people as well, is how has the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, how have their policies exacerbated this um, wealth inequality and, and loss of social mobility? And of course, um, in, in my view, by, they've incentivized globalization and financialization for the last 20 years, or maybe even 30, to where, you know, the big money is made in, in financializing uh, and commoditizing everything and moving uh, production overseas, right? And so that, of course, has been devastating for the, the domestic economy. Um, the, the other thing that's happened is we've fallen into a two-tier economy and society where the, 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 the too big to fail or jail crowd gets away with everything. You know, so for instance, there was a big investment bank. Uh, they were rigging the market. They paid a one billion dollar fine. Did anybody go to jail? Was anybody indicted? No, of course not. But if if you uh, are an employee of a local credit union and you manage to embezzle ten thousand dollars, believe me, you're going to be in prison. So we have this two tier uh, society where justice is um, for sale, or, you know, political powers for sale, and those of us who don't have uh, tremendous wealth, then we're, we're powerless in so many ways. And I think that's a big source of the frustration. 
And another thing is that, you know, as it's been harder and harder, as, as the purchasing power of our wages has declined, it's harder to build up a state, a, a, a source of capital. In other words, very most people uh, don't really have a big stake in, in the American economy. They don't own any, uh, any shares in, in corporations. They don't own any small businesses. And so they're becoming detached from um, the source of wealth, which is productivity and capital, right? And then um, this is reflected, I think, really clearly in, in the decline of rural America, that the, the uh, federal government has no real policy to uh, aid or encourage uh, productive, you know, advancement in rural America. And so rural America has been slowly dying, you know, and part of this is globalization and financialization. So what the, my kind of end point of this, uh, my list is the Fed and the federal policy have created a winner-take-most economy that it's a two-tier where they've, been, they've chosen the winners and then the rest of us are the losers and we're penalized. For, you know, because if you're not in the, the winner's circle, then you're going to pay a heavy price. And that's, I think, the, the fundamental source of frustration. Couldn't agree with your list more, Charles. It's right on. I have up my list. I, I believe we have continued inequality. Been with us for a while, but it's getting worse and worse in earnings, which I believe we haven't seen since the Gilded Age of the Robber Baron in America. And you know, we've had discussions on crony capitalism and corporatocracy before, but it's, it's running rampant now. And it, it's showing in people's frustration with inequality. It shows itself as unfairness not only in the average family working harder than ever before and not making ends meet, but also in the recognition of more and more of a two-tier justice system, exactly what you, you just mentioned. We, we see the politically connected walking away with crimes while penalties of holding Thanksgiving are, are handed out to the public. We're witnessing political polarization. We experience polar opposite views with large segments of our society. And it seems like we're shingling on one altar or the other of a belief system. We're seeing cancel culture for those who differ with those, whatever those views might be. Uh, this was clear to me in the U.S. election campaign uh, rhetoric we just went through. There's a growing sense of restrictions and limiting personal freedom. We're seeing more regulations, big brother rules, political correctness, COVID lockdowns, etc. I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just... There's frustrations out there in a huge and accelerating way. And as I said, people are barely keeping their financial head above water, making ends meet, student debts, providing for their families, opportunities to get ahead. I see it, Charles, daily in the lineups by the COVID-impacted families out of work at the food kitchens, the church, uh, church cupboards of kindness, and other food banks. I mean, if you want to believe or don't want to believe we have serious problems, just take it some time and go to one of these, and you will be stunned at the lineups of cars. And these are families that are desperate right now. Everyone that is working is being pushed harder, you know, if they are working, harder than ever with fewer people and endless problems associated when they're working with broken supply chains, uh, et cetera. They have, they have no time um, or and are restricted from seeing family and friends. They feel they have no quality of life. And, I, and this is more than just, you know, COVID here for the last year. This It's bringing some of these things to a greater fruition, but it's accelerating a lot of things that are building frustrations. And many also no longer feel safe as they experience firsthand or they see riotings and lootings on the nightly news. Many feel unsafe during the morning subway trip going to work, that is, if they have a job or, if, and frankly, up here in the Northeast, whether the subway is even working uh, because there's not enough traffic to support it. And I could go on, but that's basically the highlights of my list. Uh, Charles, any comment on that, on those? I would just add that I think you've really touched on the experiential side of the frustrations. In other words, this is what we experience in day-to-day -day life, and, and people are taking action uh, as the best they can. Like, for instance, um, Apparently, 300,000 people have moved out of the greater New York City um, area already. And, you know, home sales in suburbs and rural areas have, have, are hitting records and so on. So people are, are doing their best to, to find safety. But these larger issues that we're talking about, about repression of free speech and uh, financial repression, those we cannot escape. 
you know, we can't just uh, move move to some place and, and those all go away. And so that's really, the, the frustrations are not going to go away no matter where you live in the U.S. And so um, I think that's that's part of the topic of, of our discussion. And this chart, Charles, what I, I thought we might try and learn more from our observations, I, I first tried to group them at least showing here on the top by social, economic, or political frustrations. And the numbers re uh, reflect our previous two slides of where we, uh, each of us numbered uh, the frustrations. No, in no sequence, just uh, in, in the list. So those are the numbers that are showing there. And secondly, on the bottom, I grouped them by a different set of groupings, global, whether there were policies, government policies, decisions, or financial frustrations. And they what I saw from this is they all appear kind of equally spread everywhere. It wasn't really poking out anything, but they're certainly across those kinds of domains. Then I, I on this slide, I tried placing them in this grid where I, I took a key word from the frustration and inserted it versus the number identifier I used on a previous slide to see if we could distill something from it. Then I also sat back and tried to see meaning in the grid. And that prompted me to write down, as shown here on the left, the words or thoughts that jumped out at me when I tried to actually connect words or multiple words on the grid. And uh, just try and see if there's more distillation in that. Any comments on any of this, uh, Charles? I really like what you've done here, uh, Gordon, because it gives us like a visual sense that the frustrations we're talking about do not have one source. They, they're not, they're not just, you know, in, in the domestic economy or they're not just political. They, um, they, they cover the entire spectrum of, of the economy and society. And I think that's a, that's a profound insight right there. The more I noodle this, it led me to, to this chart was grouping the issues on two different axes. One, personal constraints on us, versus on the x-axis, economic constraints that are, that are on us. In the chart, the little diagram I'm showing with the food kitchens is not, it's just representative. It's not, it's, it just kind of ties personal constraints and economic constraints, but there's a lot of them that do the same kinds of, of things here. And the personal constraints, in many ways, is about controls that come in the form of rules or restrictions or penalties that are barriers to us pursuing the basic belief in America we're founded on of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in some way or to some degree. The other axis is economic constraints, where we are getting less for more and more, um, or it's just getting more and more difficult, or we're having to trade off things on our personal life for the benefit of our economic ones, or our economic ones are taking away from our personal lives or in, in some ways, whether they're, as, again, on that previous grid, uh, where they're coming from globally or policies or whatever. And as I say, when we're getting less for more and more, I need to remind everybody that the way capitalism works is that you actually get more for less, whereas socialism is about getting less for more. And I wasn't trying to talk about capitalism versus socialism. Socialism, but I was seeing the impacts of some of these constraints flowing in this direction, at least when I was looking at this chart, and that wasn't the, the intent of this particular chart. But and this next one is, it's, I think I could say it's about losing our freedoms where choices are being made for us versus whether globally, domestically, by the Fed, whether it's financialization. Um, or where we having to surrender, or where we're having to surrender personal freedoms or economic freedoms for the apparent good of collectivism, uh, for the better of our society, or at least we're being told it is, or whether we might think it is. And I, I'm reminded that, that the word collectivism is is the cornerstone of Marxism, whether we know this or this or not. Is that it happens to be the case, and that's whether it's orchestrated or not, but that's that's the case of uh, what Marxism is based on. Whether it's socialist authoritarianism on the bottom left versus the libertarians liberalism on the top right, another way of of uh, uh, of looking at it. Any comments on that, Charles? 
Well, and I really like your, these two charts because I think they, they, um, they express two important ideas. One is that the system that we live in, economic, social, political, is no longer working like it used to. And, and this is the source of the frustration. And the powers that be, whatever you want to call it, the status quo, the establishment, their response to this not working is they're not fixing the source of the problem. They're um, attempting to guide us into um, some future where they remain in control of everything. So they're doing that by repressing, repression and suppression and, uh, and, you know, repression of our civil liberties and our economic freedoms, right? And so, and, and I think, Gordon, both you and I put ourselves, you know, sort of in the libertarian camp um, of, 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 you know, civil liberties being the number one, uh, you know, goal of, of society. And so this, of course, is deeply disturbing to us that, um, that the policy solution we're being presented with is um, less freedom, more control by like a tiny elite. And, and that, that's usually not a solution for, you know, uh, that actually solves the underlying problems. It, it, it tends to make them worse. And I think that's what uh, we're talking about today. Exactly, sir. That's what's coming out is this elitist control. And I'm not talking about being conspiratorial, but this sense that powers to be whatever form feel that they have better judgments and, and what we should do or see um, than, than ever before. And we're seeing it in the way of censorship and these things we talked about just before uh, we started recording here. But all of this began to remind me, I'll say in this first chart, of, of two writers, maybe a lot of people haven't heard of them, who warned us decades ago, Charles, decades ago, George Orwell's 1984 book. 1984? That was in the future back then. Uh, at least uh, Orwell and Huxley were writing independently with with very different views, but where they thought our societies were going, what form it would take, would, would uh, lead us to. And, and, and bear with me if I get a little academic for a moment on these. But I originally put these two diagrams together not long after the 2008 financial crisis, which fostered some discussions we had uh, way back there and that you mentioned uh, earlier, Charles. But just in the way of background, Huxley really believed that the future was going where the control, the powers to be, would be more manipulative. They would control us through perceptions, images, and desires. They would control the fulfillment of our wants. And, you know, we saw that as materialism, the control of the media. That's definitely, definitely happened in some form. But whether it's that, whether it's that structured or tied together, we don't know. But Orwell on the right had a different view. He thought that the governments and powers to be would just simply go to re being repressive. They, they would control us through surveillance, fear, ordered compliance, control of fulfillment of our of our needs versus our, our, our wants. Boy, both these lists, Charles, do you agree they kind of ring of today in some ways? Any comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've written about um, the same, um, I don't know quite how you want to call it, um, like a dual... Uh, dual mechanisms for control in, in, in my blog, and um, I think we can. Uh, I, I I always think of, of Huxley's line that um, the goal is that we love our servitude. Yes. <laughs> and so I think I would just add that if 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 it looks like we're not loving our servitude, then we move quickly into Orwell's world because they're not going to allow us to. Um, if we don't love our servitude, then we're going to be forced into compliance. And um, you look at social media and the sort of addiction people have to it, uh, the, the, the role it plays in their life, and then the control that that, that gives, you know, central uh, powers. Um, that that's that's uh, Orwellian with an update. Everybody perceived way back when it was one or the other, and what this chart. Again, going back to uh, 2012, when I put it together, I said, no, it's not one or the other, it's a sequence. And as you just described, how that sequence might unfold, and it will be, some, could be, um, at least what I was speculating, we were speculating in time, would be transitional. This next chart 
says, well, how does that transition happen? And and the first walls, and there's two walls here in the transition, would be changing financial security and changing what I've always referred to as the foundation of sound money, which brought in the move to creditism, acceleration of debt, the financialization of the economies, uh, which you've written about extensively. And that's what we've been experiencing in an accelerating rate for at least the last 10 years, but the last 20 years are more pronounced. And that, but on the second, on the other side of it, the next progression is, is more, instead of financial security, it would be phys- physical security. And the foundation of that is our Constitution and Bill of Rights and the potential of changing those and modifying those around um, just elements of physical security. Now, again, this, these are old charts, but when I was watching the riots during the summer across America and the looting and rioting and our physical security, and then I saw us going into all sorts of debates in our election about changing the uh, the uh, Supreme Court, changing the Constitution in terms of us well, stacking the bench or um, or changing the filibuster rules or various elements, um, um, some of the elements in the Bill of, Bill of Rights, not to be political, but just the fact we're even debating it. But even the fact it's on the radar screen is indicative of this transition that we said was probably uh, the, the bridges or the walls. It would be a barrier to it. And this this chart here, at the time, and, and I didn't change. The only thing I added is that at the top right where I said we are here, we said, you know, those have been removed. Um, but what we had to do, is, the one that hadn't been re- removed, was reduce personal security through a constitutional crisis. And by golly, I almost sense at times that that's where we're at right now. If I any of I follow very much of what was going on in the in the political uh, uh, arena, and so that's why I mark where we're at right now. But just as a way of framing, um, framing a roadmap or or a philosophy or philosophical changes that are going on, this is the this chart, Charles, is the one that you and I talked extensively about, and we did two videos on, uh, just on statism up here in the top right. But we did all sorts of shows between 2012 and 2014 or 15. That where we talked about each of these different blocks in one form or the other, central planning, crony capitalism, financial repression. I even founded a whole website and a entity called the, the Financial Repression Authority based on it way back then. But it was all leading towards corporatocracy, social unrest as the driving, driving forces at the top. But on the two axes, the, the uh, Y axis being a move towards collectivism, as you see labeled here, and on the x-axis, a shift as we get more complexity into our system, more global brands. And it all started with individual individualism, but it ends up on the top right on totalitarianism. And my conclusion is when I'm really looking at all of this together is we're moving towards this world of statism where the government and again, I'm not being conspiratorial or in any way. It's it's almost a natural progression that we're expecting governments to have a much, much bigger role in decision-making in our lives. And it's no longer about the, the individual. Comments? Yeah, I, I really like there, just to go back real quickly to the, your Orwell Huxley um, and the walls. And that um, I think I thought that was very insightful because these walls of, of private uh, ownership, private enterprise, and um, personal, you know, civil liberties and security. These walls are breached. Then um, there's there's uh, really not much to protect us from the the, uh, the rise of authoritarianism that you're describing. And so, in terms of the financial wall, I mean, there's we call it the precariat, right? In other words, that there's a, a a growing number of of, of Americans who's Financial security is extremely precarious, and we've talked about this a lot. And so, uh, when that, when you become, uh, when when you have that kind of precariousness, then you're much more susceptible to um, looking at government programs like uh, universal basic income as a solution. 
but you're trading off a lot of personal uh, rights and powers by accepting these kinds of, of government you know, solutions. And in terms of, of personal security and so on, we're seeing a, a, an increasing level of abuse already. Like there's, um, just to mention one example, the civil, uh, the civil expropriation, where you know you're stopped um, for a uh, uh, defective uh, rear view uh, blinker light or something, and then they discover you have five thousand dollars cash, and then they um, they uh, they expropriate your wealth <laughs> because it must be drug money, and then you have to go through an enormously expensive legal battle to get back your money. And this is a real thing. This has been covered extensively, you know, for, for years. And so this is just one example of the kind of authoritarianism that uh, that you're describing, and it's, it's growing. It's definitely growing, and it's so surprising the rate at which it is, and now it's kind of in your face, whereas it was when uh, a few years ago we were talking about this as a possibility today i think it's it's arrived this chart i have up now is what they refer to as a nolan diagram which kind of takes some of the things we were talking about on the various axes but we were talking about crony capitalism and how it was growing with things called regular regulatory arbitrage but the role of corporate corporations involved in the, the business control of information and, and 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 control they have on the government, and I'm not just talking about lobbying, but total influence. And I have I'm often reminded that Benito Mussolini in the Second World War, he believed that the future was about the marriage of the corporation and government, and that marriage would would grow an effective economy. The word he used for it became what is called fascism. We wouldn't use such an ugly word today. But the role that corporations are now playing, and I'm thinking specifically when I'm talking about uh, the social media platforms, um, which are now practicing outright censorship, um, and that's a fact, that's not speculate, they're, they're clearly admit that, and why, and they've been called in front of the Senate now, and I think for the third time on, on it. Um, but the influence that they're now wielding, I think they, when I was listening to them in the Senate, I think they were talking down to the Senate as though it was none of their damn business. Um, but the power is is uh, is clearly there, and that's the roadmap we're on. I I put in the little picture circle here of Trump and and um, and Biden. I wasn't trying to be political. I was just trying to figure out, you know, in my own mind. Uh, again, I'm neither Republican or Democrat here. I'm a I'm a libertarian and uh, where they might position. But I challenge anybody, one of our listeners, to look at this grid and, and, and try and decide where our current political parties in the U.S. might be fitting in this or where they're leaning or what they had to do to, to get power, what they had to concede, uh, in Biden's case, to, to marry up the far left of his party with the moderate center of his party. Um, and then, of course, where Trump, where he plays to, um, in this new party, basically, it's not a Republican party, it's a new party of Trump, or the, I'll call it New Labor Party, is effectively what it is. These are major shifts in both parties. Again, not to pass judgment, but you can decide where you think they're, they're leading us. Where, not by necessarily by design, but just by the nature of our social evolution. So, and, and overlaid onto this, Charles, I want to just bridge, as we wrap up here, there's a tremendous amount of information now coming out in something called the Global Reset, uh, which is being led by the, I'll call it the Davos crowd or the World Economic Forum, the global elitists, if I was to use that word, but that's nothing more than a statement of who attends it, government at the se most senior level, all government leaders from around the world, all the major corporations in the world, and then key influencers. That's the people that go to Davos. It's by invitation only. And uh, and they and they, what they're talking about is solutions, and now they're talking about the global reset. But the drivers that are behind it to them is um, the whole movement of globalization and the complexity that's involved in that and whether, in fact, nationalization um, is going to be an impendence to globalization because many political leaders are saying, no, that's not the right way to, to go, we want to make, in Trump's case, he argues it's America first, and I don't think he's alone in that with other leaders, too. So it's breaking down, but there's a, 
And then there's this fragile versus robust systems that you've talked about quite a bit, Charles, in trying to balance the financial imbalances in the world right now and the difficulties of managing it. And, and, and then we, did, we got this massive productivity paradox where we can't create jobs at a fast enough rate that advancing robotics and, and artificial intelligence is taking away those jobs in a way of creative destruction and, and, and job creation. So, you know, they're grappling with this, this problem. And then I have up here this uh, comment on the Davos crowd, the economic forum of what, the, what they're talking about on, on it. Charles, any comment before I just I just wrap up some of the key points from the um, the economic forum? No, I'm I'm glad that you're going to cover this because this is the ultimate um, solution that's being presented, which is like increasing centralization, um, and that's and that's what you're going to describe. So yeah, this is yeah. this is this is what they're expounding right now, and I just read P, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada. Uh, was talking about it in, in spades, and let a, many of the global leaders have already started to talk openly about this. But this is the agenda in January, when the Davos crowd all meet globally. They do this annually. And in, um, in um, the leader of it is the head of the Economic uh, Forum, uh, which is Klaus Schwab. And he's written three books I have listed right here. Um, that is shaping this uh, global imperative uh, uh, agenda. And it works very much in cooperation with the United Nations in the terms of climate change and green policy initiative. This is a very a structured kind of approach with various types of implementation plan. And I'm, this chart on the right just gives you a sense of the sophistication of the plan and the documentation that's went into this. You go, I, I encourage our listeners to go to the World Economic Forum and just see some of the work that they've done. But the bottom line, Charles, is it comes down to three main components that they're, they're proposing. And the first, and these are their words, it's, it's right out of, out of their, their chapter headlines. And the first would steer the markets towards fair outcomes. The second component of the Great Reset Agenda would ensure that investment uh, investments advance shared goals such as equality and sustainability. And then the third and final priority of a global reset agenda is to harness innovations of the fourth industrial revolution to support public good, especially, they say, health, but also so social challenges. And they explode, as this diagram on the right says, how you would do it, what's involved, and what you're trying to do with it. But Charles, what rang with me when I go through it is is the is the wordsmithing that they're using when they say in the uh, number one here, they're talking about steer the market. Capitalism's what's always steered the markets. The whole idea behind capitalism and competition was to create the best ideas that would steer the market. They're saying no, 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 no. We will steer the market as a global consortium or group of countries and how we're going to steer the markets. We're not talking about just the stock market. We're talking about financial markets. The, the second one, if you read on it, they're talking about advancing shared goals. Well, shared goals, we're talking about global goals. We're talking about a global agenda. And every time I used to mention that the elitists have a global agenda, people would say, oh, you're a tin hat conspirator, conspiratorial person. And I say, no, 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 that's not what I mean. But that's what this says. This is, this is a global agenda, whatever the form it's going to shake. And they actually spell it out to, the, to country leaders who will be in attendance at Davos. And then the third one, they talk about harnessing innovation for social changes, for the social challenges, the unrest, the social unrest that's happening. And if you look at it, they're using technology the advancements, biometrics, or artificial intelligence, embedding chips for tracking COVID. They're talking about, that's what they mean by the fourth industrial revolution. These are sophisticated, advanced IT and technology instruments that are available to them. Charles, the more you read, they're really talking about what you and I did a video on, on the, uh, mirroring the, the Chinese social credit system, which is already implemented in China. And for those that are well aware of it, how profound the tracking is in every way of what you do as a Chinese citizen, or we try and do, and how what how your rights can be taken away based on a credit system. 
but the physical tracking that you're done under cameras and identification where you're going who you were with is all automated it's it's incredible that is coming to america in some form i didn't say like the chinese have it corporations are sharing that kinds of technology and this is a platform any closing comments on on the great reset charles yeah well gordon i um i think you've done a great job summarizing the sales pitch here for this and and um it, it certainly sounds wonderful in in the way they're presenting it but the way what I see in, in, in your two slides and your description of the Great Reset, I would call it the Great Divide. And the, the, the Great Divide is between centralization, which is what this agenda is, centralizing power into the hands of the few who will control the many in, in, in all the ways we've discussed. The other option, which is not described, is empowering decentralization. And using these technologies of AI, robotics, 3D fabrication, and so on, at the localized, decentralized level, and actually empowering people with them. But what this agenda that you've described, it's actually disempowering. It's, it's removing our power and our uh, agency, if you will. And and that's the wrong path, in my view. I think that we could use these same technologies to decentralize and, and re-empower people rather than take away their agency and power and give it to like some handful of elites who get to choose themselves as the leadership. So I think I think this is a huge topic and I believe you're going to um, you you've uh, created a, a, a whole slideshow or presentation on this topic specifically. I I have one and uh, coming out next uh, next week um, that that lays out this. But you know you were just talking Charles and I'm looking at this slide. I I think the Chinese uh, People's Chinese Party would would say that this was well written. <laughs> That's it's almost how they how they run the country. Are we moving towards Marxism again? Not not that people are being bad. They think that this is the solution. And I'm with you. I don't think the solution is centralization. I think it's decentralization. It's not hierarchical. It's getting the powers into the pan, hands of the individual, and and creating an environment that allows people to make great choices creative ideas and explode but not be restrictive because in the previous charts I, as what i saw was things that are restricting people not enabling people um controlling the individual as opposed to freeing the individuals restricting our economic successes because through taxation um and, and penalties and fees and all fines as opposed to saying, no, nah, people know how to spend their money better than any government or any central bureaucracy. We've, we've learned that generations after generations. But it's like we're about to learn something that our forefathers learned about the hard way and fought, and many died in trenches fighting for these, these what we see as liberties. And these are, frankly, the way I'd say, Charles, these are weasel words. We're being, we're, and, and, and that's not that they're being mean. They're just being terribly naive to to what motivates humans. And, uh, you know, when I see what everybody is going through with COVID right now, and I'm not being political in my comment about COVID, but just to the suppression everybody's living under, uh, it just, it's, it's, just, it's just terrible. And we'll get out from under COVID, but I pray to God that we just don't keep following with more and more dictatorial decisions by the government. We need them to work to help us and make us safe. Absolutely. But allow us to make decisions for the betterment of our families and our friends and ourselves. Charles, any final closing comments here? Yeah, this, I think just one, Gordon, which is I think that this uh, agenda, the Great Reset, is the sort of last dying gasp of centralization. That it's 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 the it's the the ultimate power grab, right? That we're gonna um, take care of of everyone. By imposing our idea um, of how things should be, and if you don't like it, then we're going to um, suppress your uh, dissent, and we're going to uh, coerce your cooperation. And and this is absolutely the wrong approach. And I think it's 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 not going to work. I think it will ultimately fail. And and the the danger here is the the, the greater their um, attempt to, to consolidate power, 
uh, in the hands of a few, the, the more damage we're doing to um, society and, and, and uh, the, the world. Charles, our next um, video we're going to do, we're going to talk about, uh, for our listeners, we're going to talk about the media and the media control and how it's working in concert with this uh, Great Reset and how things have um, been evolving in the consolidation of uh, media. And by media, I mean the mainstream media and the social platform media, uh, these, uh, these two elements. And I think it'll springboard from these um, presentation materials I'm putting out at Mata SII on the, on just a, a deeper, richer understanding of of the global reset. I well, for time we just I could only show you like two slides of just to get an understanding. But I challenge our listeners as you hear this word global reset more and more over the next uh, three to four months. Understand what you're listening to, Charles. Is what you said. It's a power grab. That's my opinion. It appears to be yours too, Charles. How can our listeners uh, get more information on your readings and and your writings? Yeah, please visit me at ofjourminds.com, um, and uh, you can see sample chapters in my books for free. Talk to you next month. Okay, looking forward to it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Charles.